So let's say, for instance, that we have a um, an incline of some sort, all right? And on that incline, we have some box, all right? And um, of course, this means that there's some height above ground, okay, that this uh, box, and I'm going to pay attention to the center of that box, so there's some height above ground uh, that's useful for paying attention to this particular feature. Um, of the box. And so if that thing is allowed initially, we could just say that it has zero speed, right? And uh, it's going to fall through this uh, height. And at this spot, it's going to reach its max speed. And the reason it's going to uh, obtain that maximum speed is initially, and I'm going to use a pie chart here, it has, I'm going to use capital E for energy, it has some finite amount of gravitational potential energy. So this is gravitational potential energy. And the last time we met, we learned that gravitational potential energy for uh, an object is just mass times gravity times height, mgh, or force times distance, force being the weight force mg, distance being the height that it would freely fall through or has the potential to freely fall through. So the weird thing here is its path won't be the length called height. It'll actually take a different physical path, but the amount of energy that it has as potential, meaning its ability, the ability for useful work to be done on it, which means a force would cause a displacement. Work equals force times displacement like we talked about on Monday. Okay, so it has some amount of gravitational potential energy at this point, stage of the game. Then, all of that potential energy, all right, goes into kinetic energy. Okay, so this gravitational potential, mgh, kinetic energies half mv squared, like we learned yesterday, so this is the kinetic energy part. And this is fundamentally no different than just dropping something and letting it fall straight down in terms of the energy exchange. The only difference would be is if there's any sort of friction uh, along this inclined plane. So if we assume... Uh, let's just uh, say that the coefficient of friction, it's all right, mu equals zero here, but I'll, over here, I'll put mu uh, not equal to zero. So, frictional there, no friction here, just for simplicity. Now there could be friction on that ramp and it would still be the case that it's going to have its maximum speed at the bottom of the ramp assuming that the force of gravity component along the ramp is sufficient to overcome friction. So assuming that, so it wouldn't matter whether friction was zero or not on the ramp, it's still going to have its max speed. The difference would be is that some of that gravitational potential energy 
would be lost to uh, frictional energy. So I'm, for sake of simplicity, I'm going to do a complete transfer of gravitational potential energy to kinetic energy along the ramp. The only way that you could have a complete transfer from one energy storage bin to another energy storage bin is if there are no losses. Okay, and so by loss, I don't mean that energy was destroyed. I mean it was transferred somewhere else. And so the only other place it could be would be friction, or the in, which would we would count up as the internal energy of the object and or the ground, meaning the heat that's transferred. All right, so for simplicity, we're going to have it all go uh, there. And so what this would mean is that these two equal one another. MGH would equal half mv squared. And on Monday, we showed that you could, say, get the speed of that object at the end of that ramp, okay? And so, or at the, from a free fall position, all right? Now, once it hits the flat part and the friction is no longer um, zero, there would be <clears throat> some distance So uh, at this point, all kinetic. But at some distance d, perhaps we might call it. Okay, so force times distance would be in there. Uh, it's going to come to rest, and out here where d, there's some distance that will eat up all of that energy, so to speak. There's a frictional force distance interaction. And so out here somewhere, there's some distance D where it finally comes to a stop. This makes sense. You know, if you kick a block along the floor, it'll go for a while and it'll progressively slow down and eventually come to stop. And the reason it does that is because of friction. Okay, not because the energy you transferred to it with your foot leaks out but because there's an interaction between the block and the floor, right? And so this means that over here at the end of this game, all of the kinetic energy went into what we would call internal energy, okay? And by internal energy, I mean more of the atoms are wiggling and wiggling faster than they were before because they got heated up. The internal energy of the object, the block, and the floor, the surface, quite honestly, both of those have an increased internal energy. All right? And uh, this would take on multiple forms, but largely it would be, you know, it's going to be a force times distance. Uh, I've got to get back to the pencil. Force times distance is going to be that energy. And the force is going to be the friction force, which is mu in, and that's going to be our internal energy when we have these frictional losses. So we have a situation where all the gravitational potential would be transferred to kinetic energy because there's no other no friction involved on the ramp part. We hit the flat part, it's magically frictional, like the rest of the universe, and therefore all of that kinetic energy is going to get transferred to somewhere. It can't go back to gravitational because it's not changing its elevation. So it has to go somewhere, and it would go into that work part where energy... Remember, our basic model was work equals the change in kinetic energy, and work is, generally speaking, force times distance. Right, I'm going to leave delta K, changing kinetic energy, just leave it symbolic as opposed to the half mv squared, 
just to emphasize, put the emphasis on the syllable, that work is force times distance, and force, we've seen MA, we've seen mu n for friction, uh, we've seen minus kx for springs, we'll have another version of force for buoyant forces, next semester we'll see it for electricity, there's a lot of versions of F, and force is force, it just comes in multiple shapes and sizes, so to speak, um, etc. So that's one kind of situation where you have something on a ramp with or without friction, something on a flat part with or without friction, all right? So there's, and so these pie charts allow us to um, sort of model where things are going. And these are boring pie charts because now they're, they're complete. 100% goes into 100% of that, and 100% of that goes into 100% of the other. No transfers other than all of this going to another location, the simple kind. Let's do one more of those things, uh, all flat. And this is so the first one I did is like one of the energy problems that we'll solve, and this one is like another one that we'll solve. Um, so let me uh, get this rolling here. This is a book. It's on the floor. And in this situation, we start with the, v, the speed of the thing is uh, greater than zero and going that away. It's change in speed, it's moving at a constant speed, okay, and that means acceleration is zero. The change in force on this book uh, is zero. Because the acceleration is zero, but the, the force that's on it's greater than zero. So this is like, it gets kicked. You walk in a room and this book gets kicked and it, it's moving, all right? And so that means at this stage of the game, it would just have kinetic energy. It's what it has. And let's just pretend that uh, in this region, friction is zero. But in this region, friction is not zero. So I go from frictionless, again, to magically frictional, okay? So that means that over here, it enters the friction region with all of that kinetic energy, because if there's no friction and there's no change in height, then I have no place for all that kinetic energy to go. It would just keep on magically moving, like it was in space or something. this and then here it enters that region and all that kinetic energy it's going to do uh, the same thing as before uh, what we have is now the change in speed is going to be less than zero okay that means a negative acceleration that means it's going to slow down and eventually we're, we can assume reasonably that it's a constant. The friction of the surface is a constant force, constant deceleration, if you will. Uh, and again, this is over some distance d that this work is happening. And so over here, all of that kinetic will have to go to internal energy. So we have... constant 
kinetic energy and then in this phase the kinetic energy goes to internal energy. So these are the sorts, you know, a picture like this helps logging what's true and true symbolically and then just going through, you know, what transfers are happening. So those are the simple ones. So let's do one before we get into the problems that is not as simple and this is another one of your problem types it's the last one so I just gave example for number three four and I'm about to give an example for number five here and then we'll start working through them more explicitly uh, so but let's talk about this situation so we have the Atwood machine and it is a An Atwood machine is just a pulley. It's a simple machine. And this pulley, like all pulleys, has a rope attached to it. And there will be blocks or some sort of load. That's what we're symbolizing here. All right, and I could say that this is um, mass one. And this is mass two, and I could uh, have things start on the ground here. All right, so there's this pulley attached to some ceiling with a rope over it. There's a mass attached to each end of the rope and uh, one of them's on the ground and one of them's falling. Okay, so if mass one is greater than mass two, okay, if that's the case, then that's going uh, to imply that uh, the acceleration of mass one is down, the acceleration of mass two is up. So that's what is necessarily going uh, to happen. So let's pie chart this. So initially, okay, uh, the goes into okay goes into all right so goes into my cute way of doing that we have uh, entirely actually I wanted I hope you weren't writing in pen because I'm going to lower the floor okay so let's think about this. So if that block is off the floor, then there is a height, call it height two, that mass two is off the ground. Well, there's also a height one for a mass one that's off the ground. So now when we go to section this up, both elements in the system, both parts of this system, have gravitational potential energy. Okay, One of them has a lot and one of them has a little. And so what really matters most about this pie charting method is that you simply have some relative magnitudes that make sense. So the gravitational potential energy of mass 1 is much larger than the gravitational potential energy of mass 2. Is it three times bigger? Sure, it looks to be that way. You know, if it was halfway up, then I would split the pie chart. It doesn't have to be exact, just needs to be a reasonable approximation because you're not trying to solve 
the problem with the pie chart. The pie chart's just letting you log, oh, the gazentas, the initial energy piece of this puzzle, has two pieces of gravitational potential energy that are not the same. One of them is larger than the other because the height is larger. That's all that the pie chart is doing. All right. So if that's allowed to fall, mass one falls, then mass two rises, then at some other point in the in time, okay, we're gonna have a new state of the system. And this is one reason why you'll often find energy defined as uh, the state of or condition of one or more objects. Actually, that's, I need to draw my rope first. So we can have block one. bring them up a little higher. So let me draw this first before you copy it. We could really pick any point in time uh, to do the analysis. So let's just pick it when they're the same height off the ground. So, they're both, you know, height one and height two are the same in this situation. And so let's just think about this. If that's the case, there's, but it's also, let's not forget something, this one is accelerating down and this one is accelerating up. And that means that in both cases, speed is not zero. So this is the important conceptual part. If neither speed is zero, then both have kinetic energy. Obviously, one's going to be a plus speed, one's going to be a minus speed, or velocity, rather. But energy doesn't care about direction. Energy cares about magnitude. So the V in the 1 half mv squared is a magnitude. It's a speed, not a velocity. All right? So it, it, and even if it was, it's getting squared. So it wouldn't matter uh, one way or the other. But it looks to me like the uh, both gravitational potential energies are the same amount and both kinetic energies are the same amount. What's not clear is, you know, is each, is the gravitational potential of one equal to the kinetic energy of one, okay? We don't really care, because all we want to do is use the pie chart to say, well, I have some gravitational potential energy for mass one, and I have kinetic energy for mass one. I have gravitational potential for mass two, and I have kinetic energy for mass two. I have pie charts that represent this situation. Don't have a lot of room, but guess what? If we let it fall further, then we would have a reversal of the gazentas. Okay, so here's the gazatas. Okay. And we could have a reversal where the gravitational potential of mass two is equal to the gravitational potential of mass one. It could flip the script. All of the potential energy that mass one had went into its speed and the speed of mass two and reversed the tables. So it just arbitrarily picked points in the motion just as a demonstration of the pie charting. So pie charting is to energy problems as system schema was to force problems. That's the goal there. So we'll have a celebration a month from now where we'll solve energy problems and I'll want to see pie charts, I'll want to see system schema, I'll want to see graphical, I want to see all the tools brought to bear on solving those problems. And we'll uh, move into that now.
So if you want to uh, take a look at your energy problem worksheet, how would we apply this to these set of problems that I've given you? So problem number one, it says for this problem, do not use energy. So we want to compare the old school methods uh, to the new school methods, if you will. All right, and so uh, a ball is thrown straight upward with a velocity of 15 meters per second. How high does it go? So I'm gonna, would want to see here some graphical analysis. So we would have velocity versus time. We would have acceleration versus time, all right? And there would be uh, a coordinated time, okay, where ideally we would be paying attention to when the speed hits zero. So we know it leaves at some speed, okay, which is gonna be 15. And immediately gravity is gonna start slowing it down at a constant rate, which is why it's a straight line, all right? And uh, since that's a negative slope, I guess I should have uh, given myself some negative space to uh, do my acceleration uh, time, but we can leave that, it won't matter much. So we'll just go with magnitudes here. We know that that's G, okay? We'll just say 10 meters per second per second. And from uh, this sort of analysis, we would know that, uh, so up here, so delta Y would be that space that I've highlighted in pink, we know would be one half the change in speed times the change in time. Well, you don't know the change in time just yet. Okay, so we could, uh, we'll just kind of pause that uh, for the moment. Then here we have uh, an area to deal with. And so we have uh, delta V equals A delta T. We know the delta V, it's a negative 15. We know that acceleration is a minus 10, yay. That means our change in time is 1.5 seconds. So delta Y, the thing we'd like to know, would be one half uh, the height of the triangle which is 15, we don't actually compute the negative part of that because it's 15 high, okay? And then this 1.5 seconds that we got from the um, other piece of the puzzle from downstairs. And if you do the math, you get 11.25 meters. So if it's 15 meters per second and it only flies for a second and a half and something's slowing it down the whole time, it makes sense that it won't go 15 meters, which is what it would go if there was nothing decelerating it, all right? So that's the graphical analysis approach to the problem. The uh, energy approach which is what number two is asking for, okay? It says, redo number one using energy considerations. Okay, so I have point, uh, we could call it uh, T for top. We could call this point B for bottom, all right? And We know that 
it goes up, starts at speed of 15 meters per second, speed zero at the top, all right? So how do we solve this with an energy consideration? So, you know, what is energy up here? And what is energy down here? Well, up here, I have all gravitational potential energy. And down here, I have all kinetic energy. So kinetic energy is transferred to gravitational potential energy, all of it. So since that's the case, I would literally write E sub K equals E sub G. Uh, this is the initial this is the final. Initially, it has all kinetic energy. Finally, it has no kinetic energy at that top, how high it goes. But it has obtained gravitational potential energy that it didn't have at the beginning. All of the moving energy went into potential energy, height above ground energy, if you will. All right? So now we, the physics is done at this point, all right? So we could actually, you know, uh, PID, physics is done, and now it's a math problem. So kinetic energy we know is one half mv squared. Gravitational potential is mgh. Uh, so we know the m's cancel, half v squared uh, equals gh, so that means h is going to be v squared over 2g. So 15 squared over 2 times uh, 10, since we used it before, and guess what we get? Same answer. Which method is better? I would venture to say that the energy method is better. It's uh, conceptually superior and it's mathematically simpler. Um, it's deceptively longer because I wrote bigger, all right? But there was more scribbling with the graphical approach, all right? And it, you're forced to think in graphical terms, which is perfectly fine. Uh, but they're both equally, I would say they're technically they're equally good. Um, energy has the advantage of all I have to figure out is what does it start with and what does it end with. I write the equations on those sides of the equal sign and it's a math problem after that. So it has that advantage going for it. Right? Even if it was a complicated math problem, then you could just slam it into, you know, a computer and let it solve it for you uh, if it was a hard problem to solve mathematically. It's not in either case. So that's how you would do one and two, which were set up. How would I use it from a kinematics approach? How would I use it from a um, energy approach? All right. Moving on. Number three. So this is like, you know, a horror movie. You walk into a room and you see a box moving with velocity and you keep you stay in the room instead of running, okay? You know, why is this box moving uh, magically uh, in the problem? And it's, it, we're told that it has a mass of 10 kilograms, yay. If internal energy can be found by this formula, seven joules per meter times the distance, okay? Where D is the distance travel, how far does it go before coming to rest? So we have this problem that's pretty natural. Whether you knew how the box got moving or not doesn't really matter unless it's a magic floor, okay? 
this box is going to stop moving. And it's going to stop moving because of friction. You probably didn't even need to come to college to know that. You may not have called it friction, but you know the floor is going to bring it to rest. Okay? So we could draw a nice picture, because that's always a good idea, is to draw pictures. So here's the floor. Uh, we can put a box on that floor. We'll say that it's a 10 uh, kilogram box. Just put that front and center on the box. We're told that it has a speed of seven meters per second. We'll put it going that direction. There is a distance D. that we know is going to come to rest in. How far is it going to go uh, before it comes to rest? That's our problem. And we're also told that the internal energy that's going to be become evident, so to speak, in this is defined as 7 joules per meter times the distance traveled. Now what is a joule per meter? Good question, I'm glad you asked. A joule per meter is a newton meter per meter, which is a newton. So we just learned on Monday that joules are newton meters. All right, so that's an absolutely brand new knowledge unless you had physics before this class. Uh, and so a joule per meter, meaning how many bits of energy per meter traveled, how much work done per meter, if you will, well, that means it's a force. One way to think of force is how much work's done per meter. Okay, And this is a frictional force. So the, nat we, the nature of that force is, is that we don't even need to worry about mu in because it's already been defined functionally the internal energy, i.e. friction, is 7 uh, joules, or minus 7 joules. Wasn't it minus? No, just 7 joules. How far does the box go before doing that? So guess what we have here? If I use pie charts, I know that initially it's all kinetic energy. Okay, because... It's moving. When I walk in, it's moving at seven meters per second. And then, since, and you'd probably notice that it's slowing down, which means you know that it's gonna to come to stop after some distance D that you don't know. And the reason it's gonna to come to a stop is because there was a frictional force involved where eventually speed is gonna be zero because of that frictional force which is why all of that energy went from kinetic to um, internal energy. So this means that one half mv squared is going to equal this seven joules per meter times the distance d. Don't confuse the m in joules per meter with the m in mass. All right? So d, if I, you know, do all the rearranging and whatnot, we'll just keep it simple. One half of the mass, which was 10, speed squared was 7 squared, divided by this 7 uh, joules per meter. I'll just leave the units off because we know that it's, all these units are made to cancel out. And uh, guess what I'm going to get? I'm going to get, well, you could, you don't even need a calculator. This 7 will kill that one. And you have uh, half of 70. 
or 35, and it's going to be meters if all of our units were, were correct. That's a long ways, but 7 meters per second, that's pretty fast. You probably can't run that fast unless you're being chased by a velociraptor or something. All right. Adrenaline kicks in. So pretty easy solution method if you know that kinetic energy is half mv squared, if you know that internal energy is either uh, mu nd, the frictional force, if you have enough of that information. So if we knew the coefficient of friction, we would just do the weight of the box as the normal force, and then the distance d. So we could, we could work that out, okay? Uh, in fact, we could figure out the coefficient of friction if we wanted to uh, do that. So simple, simple, simple. Uh, you'll see in the other lecture where I do, I think it's five or six energy friction problems, they're just standard textbook issue problems using all the equations and force analysis and whatnot embedded in there. And so you'll take notes on that and you'll, there'll be an interesting contrast between this and those types of problems. Um, both are part of the objectives, uh, the learning objectives, but obviously these sorts of approaches are superior. They, they, they're simpler, they're quicker to the point, etc. And those, are, depending on what level of science you're going into, determines you know, how much of that's going to be uh, important in your professional game later on down the road. All right, so another problem that's a ramp problem, so like the first one we messed with, except now we're going to uh, get to do some math uh, associated with it. So another box up on the hill. It's a five kilogram box. Uh, the height above ground here is two meters according to the problem. Problem says that there's no friction on the ramp part equals zero. So over here from a pie chart standpoint all gravitational just like the one uh, that we uh, started off with. You know, if this was a speed zero, this is a speed not zero, okay? And it's actually going to be its max speed. Uh, and so it's going to be all kinetic at the bottom of the ramp. But we're told in this problem uh, that we can uh, ramp its frictionless once the box reaches the bottom where there is friction for every one meter the box travels on the flat earth internal energy or E sub I increases by 100 joules where does the box stop and then the last thing hint, use the expression from number 2 for E sub I well that doesn't mean that uh we use seven joules per meter because it told us that the energy internal consumption rate is 100 but it's going to be 100 joules per meter times that distance so same structure as the previous problem but the number has to be different the number they gave us all right uh, so we have that and that means that at the end of this run when uh, the speed is zero, we're going to have all internal energy. All right. So that's uh, mapping out the problem. I guess I forgot one thing in here. Uh, friction not equal to zero. Hence the reason why it comes to a stop after some amount of time. Well, we could start throwing in all of the 
uh, equations, but just want to, I guess, emphasize something here. If I could call, I'll call this A, I'll call this B, and I'll call this C. Guess what? A equals B, right? All the gravitational potential is transferred to kinetic energy at the bottom of the ramp because there's no other energy bin that's being transferred to. So EG equals EK. Gravitational potential equals kinetic. And then, since there are no other energy, there's, it's one entire energy bin transferring everything it has to another energy bin, then that means B equals C. Well, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. I don't even need to consider the kinetic part. I, I mean, I could go and compute the speed, but it didn't ask for that. It asked a real question this time. Where does the box stop? So really, all I need to do is deal with um, uh, the equation EG. All of that boils down to the fact that gravitational potential equals the internal energy change. All right? That means MGH, gravitational potential, equals 100 joules per meter D. So where does it stop? It stops at some distance D, which is going to be... Uh, MGH divided by that 100, so 5 kilograms, I'm just going to skip the, all the units, I'll go with 10 for ease of computation. The height was 2, and we're dividing all that by 100, so the distance this box is going to go is a whopping 1 meter, because I have 100 over 100. So. Why show all of that work when it's just one energy equal the other? Well, whether you wrote all of that or not, the idea here is, is you would eventually recognize that that's the fact. Okay? And that's the game with energy. What are the gazentas and the gazatas? Okay? The distance that I'm concerned with had an input of kinetic energy and an output of all internal energy. Where did it get the kinetic energy? Got 100% of it from the height that it was at. Oh, then I don't even need the kinetic because those numbers are going to be equal. And so if the gravitational potential, which is probably the easiest energy computation because it's just three, a product of three things, okay, no other twists. Well, of course, I guess E sub I in this case is the easiest. It's just a, a number of times letter all right still products and this is easy peasy so an energy budget almost always is the superior methodology for solving physics problems or chemistry biology problems because it totally pays attention to this fundamental conservation law of the universe energy is neither created nor destroyed it's just it changes forms it goes from one storage facility, so to speak, to another. And remember, energy is not stuff. Energy is an accounting system. And we account for changes in speed and position for systems that have inertia. Again, not a definition that's in a book anywhere because I haven't written it yet. But it is extracted from all that is known about energy. Zeroth Law Theorem. Uh, way to go there. Now, um, that was number four. Number five. I guess I should uh, label this. Number five is that Atwood machine problem. In the picture below, M1 starts off at rest 1.5 meters above ground. The mass is this is three, the other one's two. How fast is M1 moving uh, when it hits the ground? 
all right? Well, I am going to, since I explained to you yesterday, you were, or not yesterday, but Monday, you were shown, I were giving you the handout, we went over in class, which showed the force approach to this machine, the Atwood machine, versus the energy approach. And we saw that they both came down to the same speed equation if you want to, if you solve for the acceleration of the blocks and then use the zero thaw theorem to squeeze velocity out of that, you get this velocity equation that is the square root of two times the difference in mass over the sum of mass, so the mass differential, times g times the height, which I'll call delta y. Well, I'll go ahead and call it h. Why not? Now, the thing I want to remind you of is an object, you know, a free fall, you know, rock, so to speak. If I drop it, okay, and it goes some height h, Right? Then I'm going to have mgh is half mv squared, and like we showed the other day, velocity is root 2gh. That's in the free, totally freely falling system. An Atwood machine is a uh, free falling ish. Okay? Uh, the problem is, is that there's this rope connected to both blocks with a pulley in between it. So yes, it's in free fall because gravity is the only reason things moving, short of somebody pushing a block or pulling one. So assuming there's a mass differential, which there is in this case, I just want to point out, remind you, that I still have a 2GH here. But what's different is this mass factor, okay, which is necessarily less than one since it's the difference of two things over their sum. That means it has to be a proper fraction. There's a fraction of g, so less than full uh, 10. And so we have the same exact structure that we got from both energy and force approaches. And we keep seeing this structure pop up. So once I have this equation, which I'm authorizing you to use, we just put in uh, the data. Uh, how fast is it moving when it hits the ground? So the mass, uh, you know, so 3 minus 2 over 3 plus 2, square root of all of that. So 2 uh, times 1 fifth times 15, it's going to be square root of 6, so 2.45 meters per second. That's how fast it's going to be going when it hits the ground. And that's a wrap. So uh, I do believe one of the other videos actually goes over the derivation that I gave you on paper the other day, if I remember right. But if not, it's on paper. Um, and it's just a rehash of everything we've done so far. So that's that.